feelings, um, non-rational sublogical stuff is apparently, and it looks pretty solidly, involuntary. Uh, I'm walking down the street at night, suddenly somebody comes up behind me and fires an air rifle in my ear, I'm going to jump through the roof and scream maybe because I wasn't expecting that and I probably wouldn't be able to really control myself for a couple of seconds um, if I'm suddenly startled. Uh, that's involuntary. I'm going to react. You know, it's just how it is, right? Um, now, one could say then that my reaction was determined by necessity. Necessity is all the uh, is everything that's outside of my control. Um, I didn't have any control over the fact that somebody was going to sneak up behind me and put a toy in my ear and go bang and startle me like that. So I reacted in an involuntary manner, regardless of what I may have wanted to do when somebody did that. Uh, it's just going to happen, right? Stimulus response actions. However, one could say that, in a sense, I have kind of exercised my will in not training myself or not accustomizing myself to sudden starts. Like, let's say, for whatever reason, I didn't want to react in a scared, frightened, startled way whenever something like this happened. Now, okay, that's pretty hard, right? We seem to be hardwired to freak out and get an adrenaline sh rush when suddenly a loud noise happens to us when we're relaxed. Um, but could you actually reduce the amount of startledness that you feel in the future? Not for the one that you're in right now, not for the sudden adrenaline rush or start or <gasps> whatever it is, but for ones in the future. Could you train yourself? Now, in a sense, when you do that, you're creating your own future, right? Um, like, for example, I could um, ask somebody to randomly fire an air rifle in my ear, um, say, ten times over the course of the next week. Um, and I would sort of try to bear in mind all the time that somebody's going to do this and that I want to uh, be less freaked out by it when it happens. Now, there's all kinds of problems inherent in this, but at least you've made the effort to sort of control something that in many ways looks as though it's not in one's control. Um, I can sort of constantly remind myself that this could happen. Um, I could create an inner sense of anxiety so that I'm always sort of slightly on edge as opposed to uh, sometimes, you know, no peaks or valleys, but, you know, I'm sort of halfway between being completely relaxed and being a complete nervous wreck. Um, there's any number of ways that you could prepare for the starts ahead. And I think in many ways this explains the difference between, say, anxiety and um, equanimity, I guess. Uh, the anxious person uh, may or may not be consciously or subconsciously creating inner anxiety as a buffer against the terrors of sudden horrors leaping up into their face. Um, you learn to sort of spread the anxiety out over the course of your life. Uh, a lot of people develop, I guess, chronic anxiety that way. And, and that's why I say that this is not necessarily uh, a simple um, thing to engage in. But let's say you learn to see the world as a place where these things could happen. You sort of train yourself to accept the fact that I live in a world in which air rifles could be discharged in my ear at any given moment. It could startle me. And I have to accept the fact that that's the way the world is. Um, or any equivalent of air rifles discharging in my ear. I have to accept the fact, perhaps, that the world is such a place that, I don't know, I might get, 
in the next 10 years carted off to a labor camp in the middle of the night. Now, I live in Canada. Such things, arguably at least, are rare here. An Aboriginal Canadian might say something different, but that's another story. Um, but you, you have a choice to sort of see the world as a place where you do not get hauled off to Auschwitz, um, or you may get hauled off to Auschwitz, or you probably will get hauled off to Auschwitz. Uh, those are viewpoints, right? Those are um, points of reference. What is the world like? Um, what is its ultimate nature? What are the odds of this happening to me? How much should I prepare for this? Um, and this might vary depending on everyone's conditions, right? And, and I think this may have something to do with the fact that some people walk out of Auschwitz, having survived it, going, oh, God, that was horrible. Well, back to life. Whereas other people are just sort of saying, well, I've discovered what life really is. It's just a hellhole, a horrible thing, and all you got to do is worry constantly about the knock on the door or the rifle butt banging against the door at 2 a.m. Uh, you might as well reconcile yourself to nail-biting from the moment you're born till the moment you're dead. Franz Kafka kind of thing. Um, which is it? What's the most reasonable way to see the universe? Well, it, uh, again, it depends on what angle you've taken. Do you believe that you live in a universe where things like that shouldn't happen? Well, okay, that's very, all very well, so if you think that things like that shouldn't happen, then when it does happen to you, it's an injustice, injustices can be fought, etc., etc., etc. If you sort of have adopted a point of view that, yes, things could happen like this, and the best thing to do is to prepare oneself without ruining all the good stuff in life, um... Or you could take the point of view that it's just a matter of time before it does happen. Fatalism, I guess. Um, what is the best way to deal with the fact that at any moment someone could sneak up on me and discharge an air rifle in my ear? Now, let's say that you take the point of view that I live in a world where this might happen and it might not happen. It could happen, and I might as well get ready for it, but I don't want it to wreck my life by walking around a nervous wreck all the time, develop an ulcer, chronic anxiety, whatever. I can take a certain point of view. I can sort of say, okay, if this happens, I will attempt to react to it in this way. Uh, if it doesn't happen, I will attempt to enjoy the good times uh, without worrying too much about sudden disasters. Um, but I will actually, in some way, keep that option of reacting to disasters in my back pocket to be summoned up when disaster does strike. In other words, I'll enjoy things as they happen, but I won't believe that this is my right, that this is the way the world is, because I already know that the world is not a nice place. At least it's not the perfect place that we want to think that it is. So when good things happen, I can enjoy them, and when bad things happen, I have taught myself to at least in as much as it's possible for me to endure them and even to accept them and embrace them, the bad times as well. Uh, just accept that this is just the way it is. I got to deal with it. Um, and I mentioned before, stoic habit forming kind of comes into play here. If I have consciously trained my mind for kind of the future, um, I'm not looking behind me anymore as, as the vanishing point recedes into the distance and the world goes by like this. I'm turning around and I'm looking into the face of the monster. And it isn't so much that I sort of have surrendered to the monster, because I understand that there is enough in the world that I actually enjoy. There's a, a lot about life that I certainly enjoy. Uh, monster or not, he can't he, it, whatever, can't take that from me, my fundamental love of existence, if that's the, how I choose to see existence, if that's how I choose to see my fate, my destiny, uh, if that's how I choose to see necessity, or that which is not in my control, or whatever. Um, I can train my mind to work this way. So that 
in the future, not in the moment, my sublogical reactions to things, my involuntary reactions to, say, trauma or surprise or sudden terrors or sudden dangers or whatever, isn't as destructive as if I didn't train myself for it. Um, now, how much of this is going to be within the realm of the possible is a massive deb debate, I, pr I presume. But I think that over time you can teach yourself how to react in the future, even though your reaction in the future will not be voluntary. In a sense, you have actually changed the nature of your involuntary action in the future by altering your point of view in the present. Who's better equipped to deal with the fact that he's being unloaded from a cattle car and herded into Auschwitz? Somebody who has simply never even faced the possibility that this could happen? Or there's one way to look at it. B, somebody who has faced and has sort of made contingency plans for it, um, but it's more or less on in the, in the case of a what-if scenario. What if I do end up in those circumstances? And a third person say says, it's inevitable that I will be unloaded from a cattle car and herded into Auschwitz, and there's no way I can avoid it. That's just the way the world is. I would say that the best way to train yourself to deal with the calamities of life is to say it may happen and that I should plan for it. Now, the number of things that can happen in your life that are disastrous are, well, it's enough to boggle the mind, right? Um, but, you know, and, and our ability to cope with it all is not as, it, it's not, we, 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 we're not in complete control of what we are and how we react to things. Um, but we are somewhat in control. So the, the person B, or the second person, the person who has allowed for it and has planned for it if it does happen, but doesn't just assume that it's inevitable, strikes me as the person in the best position to emerge from it intact. Um, the first person has just refused to allow for it, kind of a blind, self-destructive optimism. The second person has surrendered to it before it even happened. They've, they've walked around in a state of angst their whole existence, just they know that inevitably they're going to get shoved into the equivalent of a concentration camp in, in some way in their life. Um, those are the two extremes. The middle road would say it may happen, it may not happen. I'm in control of some of my reactions to it, I'm not in control of all of them. And it, whether or not I can actually react to them in the best way in the future, when I'm looking into the onrush of events as opposed to backwards as the events recede into the past. Um, the best way to do that is to train my mind or train my self, my spirit, my whatever you want to call it, to self-discipline, to, to allow for it. Again, that's stoic habit forming, right? You, you make the effort in real time, all the time, in your life, to see things a certain way that allows for potential disaster in the future, but doesn't necessarily spoil the present that you're living in. Um, as opposed to, say, the other type of person who kind of lives in the past, as it were. And again, the assumption here is that almost everybody lives in the past. That's simply how they see time. Um, they kind of have abrogated control over their future and or con abrogated control over your, their future events. Um, everything's wonderful. I'll just stay where I am. Thank you. And I won't bother to think I'll become morally, emotionally, psychologically, intellectually lazy. Morally, I'm not sure of, but you know, I'll become lazy up here. I won't continue to analyze things all the time in real life because, well, that takes too much mental effort, right? And I'll just assume that since the chances of me getting hit in the face with a shovel are very remote, that it won't happen to me. Oh, what are you going to do when it does happen? You're really badly uh, set to deal with it. But do you want to go through life always worried about the fact that 
around every corner, somebody could be standing there with a garden spade about to hit you in the face with it. That strikes me as overkill. Blind optimism is kind of dumb. Blind pessimism is equally dumb and toxic. Uh, how about neither optimism nor pessimism, but just a calm appraisal of what's ahead of you and what your options are? Not, not by any means easy, but possible. Again, in the real world, we know of cases like this, where something that destroys one person kind of doesn't destroy another person. Um, what is it? What is it that makes the difference? Again, I think it's a perspective that can be cultivated. I can train myself here and now to deal with the fact that calamities may happen, that good things may happen as well, and I won't miss out on them. But rather than being blinded by either, rather than being blinded by disaster or blinded by too much happiness or pleasure or joy or whatever, I sort of go, okay, I've got to kind of balance both. That, I think, can be done. Now, what does that say about determinism and consciousness? In real time, as things happen, my reaction to them might not be in my control. In fact, hardly at all. But if in my past I have used my past, or the present that was once my past, to prepare for the future, but not in such a way that the present is poisoned, as in the case of the chronic uh, anxiety uh, sufferer, I have used the present to allow for the future, good or bad, or positive or negative, or whatever you want to, whatever terms you want to use. Then when the events happen, they may be involuntary in the moment, but they might not be involuntary in terms of the tapestry of your entire existence. You're kind of weaving the past, the present, and the future into a, into a single thing, where you learn from the past, you prepare for the future without poisoning the present. The present is where you would actually enjoy things, right? That's Epicurus. Um, you only enjoy things as you're doing them, or as you're enjoying them. Okay, so you use your present to enjoy the things that are conducive to health, and to prepare for things that may not be, but without ruining the pleasures that you're enjoying in the present, and pleasures I use very broadly here to include things like love, joy, whatever. Um, I, I'm not really sure how much of what we are is determined, but I'm not really sure how much of what we are is a matter of choice. Again, how many people can train themselves to deal with the fact that, I don't know, they're going to be sitting in a uh, a room in a house somewhere, and the atom bomb is going to get dropped on them, which did happen to people in Hiroshima and, Nag Hiroshima and Nagasaki. How could you prepare for this? Um, but at least you could prepare for it in terms of making sure that your present is not wrecked by it. You can allow for the fact that we live in a universe in which disaster can happen at, at any moment, but not succumb to chronic anxiety. You can teach yourself to do that, to deal with the things that happen in life. Again, I think this is psychotherapy. Um, <clears throat> how does that inform ideas of what is determined and what is in our control? We might not be in control of the immediate present, but we can use the present to control slightly what will be our present in the future if we cultivate a uh, particular point of view. Um, it's, you know, the old hope for the best, prepare for the worst type thing. Balance of the two. And in the present, you have the ability to attempt a balance, to attempt to see ahead, to attempt to guess what's going to be flying out of the monster's mouth at you. Um, you can think about things like death. That way, when it does come, it might not be quite so terrifying. I think that a lot of people are essentially horrified of death and try and blot it out of their minds. I agree with Zapfe on this. I think that's why people have all these anchors and everything. They can't 
bring themselves to face it. But all that they're doing is postponing something that is going to happen. And then when it does happen, they're in no way ready for it because they've spent their lives staring into their iPhone or something like this. Whereas the other person just walks around or doesn't even walk around in a state of strickenness where all that they can think about is death. It ruins everything. Um, it's just, how can you enjoy anything when all of this is going to be wrenched from you? And doesn't that make you seize up? It should, right? Because look, everything that you do is, will be abolished. Well, yeah, but you can look at it the other way that I often point out. Whatever horrors you, you endure will be snuffed out at death. Is death necessarily a bad thing? No, you can train yourself to stare right at death in kind of a, not an impassive or neutral way, but in as balanced a way as possible. Um, or any sort of disaster that you're afraid of. And that way, if you've sort of said, okay, I've stockpiled myself against calamities in as much as it is possible, I can now relax and enjoy my morning cup of coffee and savor its flavor. Um, because in as much as uh, it's possible, I've allowed for the future. Um, as opposed to being either dominated by it or ignoring it completely. What's in your control is a deceptive thing. Are we talking about in your control now? In control of what now? I might be in control of my future reactions to a certain extent, even though my present reactions might not be in my control. But if in the past I have exercised my control to prepare for what's happening to me now, then my involuntary reactions might not be on a broader canvas or tapestry of my life. I might not, it might not be um, fully outside of my control because in my past I invested energy and effort into preparing for the fact that it could happen. Um, Self-control is a deceptive thing. I've been doing yoga now for say five years, intensive yoga actually. Now, I've, I look back on that five years that I spent sometimes doing this, and I feel a great sense of gratitude. Gratitude to who? To my past? The past is gone. It doesn't exist. Ah, yes, but I did kind of engineer myself at that time for the here and now. I feel myself to be a better person than I was before I went into this regime um, of getting up every morning at 5 a.m., rushing off to yoga, then going to work, etc., I have prepared for the now or for what's in the future in the past, even though the future and the past don't exist. The shadow of the past is still upon me. The shadow is the last five years where I've engaged in intensive self-discipline. So how much of what is happening to me right now is determined and what has it been determined by? It's been determined by choices I made in the past, right? But, and those choices in the past were by no means necessity. They were by no means outside of my control. I had the option of going to yoga or not going to yoga. It, at some sort of period, some sort of present, which is now in my past. I had some, I had choice of going, you know, hauling my sorry ass into the yoga studio every morning or not hauling my sorry ass into the yoga studio early in the morning. I invoked my will. Because I invoked my will in the past, my present is different than it would have been if I hadn't. And my future, the way that I will relate to things, when I turn around and stare into the gigantic beast that's about to swallow me, um, I'm more prepared than if I hadn't engaged in self-discipline. So free, unfree, determined, not determined, and everything kind of breaks down at this point. And you're talking about psychology, or you're talking about... Um, first person experience or when you're talking about in the moment of becoming or whatever. Um, what does it mean at this level of thinking for something to be determined or not determined or to be in your control or not in your control? Am I responsible for my past? Not necessarily because I can't change it, but can I be grateful for my past or can I sort of look back and say, this was, you know, I'm glad that I did engage in this behavior or in this these practices because my present and my future are now more sort of secure, as it were, because of my past. Yes. 
I can sort of say, yes, I'm grateful for my past, even though I haven't changed, I, I haven't, I have no control over my past. Who am I grateful for? Who am I grateful to? Me. Nobody else got out of bed at 5 a.m. gluey-eyed and semi-conscious, you know, got dressed and went off to a 5 a.m. yoga class or whatever, 6 a.m. Uh, I did that. So who am I grateful to? Myself. Thank you for doing, making the efforts, Andy. I'm now in a better condition than I would have been if I hadn't done that. Um, so in, in a sense, the fact that the present is out of my control completely isn't the end of the story. It all depends on what I had done leading up to the present. You see, you can't really, you know, your feelings are involuntary, but when you set the stage for what your feelings are going to be, is that really as involuntary as it might look at the time? Interesting question. And it kind of goes to the heart of, again, stoic habit forming or training yourself to react in a certain way, in a more or less involuntary way, which I believe certainly can be done.